Hi there. Hello. Hi. And welcome to the Science and Eternity podcast, where we explore the relationship between groundbreaking science and the human experience. This time we're looking at AI and whether humans can transcend their limits through artificial intelligence. With me today, I've got Noreen Herzfeld, Ruta Professor in Science and Religion at St. John's University in Minnesota. Noreen holds degrees in computer science and mathematics and a PhD in theology. And you're the author of numerous articles and journals in the popular press, as well as a book I have particular interest in, uh, The Limits of Perfection in Technology, Religion and Science. Now, I'm interested in that book, partly because I'm an expert myself in perfection. Uh, just the other day I was asking my team, these guys, to tell me about my flaws, but they struggled to find any flaws at all. Is your book title suggesting then that I'm not perfect? I'm afraid so, Tom. Uh, okay. Because you wouldn't want to be perfect. If you were perfect, the only way to go would be down. You wouldn't be able to change anymore. Once you've reached perfection, uh, you, you've reached the goal and there's nothing more to strive for. Mm -hmm. I think perfection is an interesting thing because I think, I think it's something that we desire. We desire to be better than ourselves, to transcend our limits. I mean, you can see that in the, in the way that we've used modern technology. We've, in many ways, been able to push back the limits of our own mortality. But it's got me asking the question, can we truly transcend our limits through technology? Clearly, technology does allow us to transcend a lot of limits. As you just pointed out, it's amazing to think that the average life expectancy of a woman in Japan is now 85. 200 years ago, the average life expectancy of a woman in Sweden was only 35. So technology has certainly allowed us to transcend what would have looked like a limit on the human age span. And so many other limits, if we think about the variety of technologies and how they amplify the capabilities we have, our sensory organs, look at the Hubble telescope looking into deep space and how that amplifies our vision, or think about all of the modes of transportation that we have now, including sending a probe to Mars and how that has taken us off what would have seemed like an absolute limit of the planet that we live on. So technology clearly helps us to push against what look like the boundaries of human endeavor. If technology has created all of this positive change, uh, would I not be reasonable in saying that technology is the most reliable, if not sole source of human flourishing? Technology definitely is a source of human flourishing. Through technology, we're able to adapt our environment, and uh, that has given us tremendous advantages in the survival of individuals and the survival of our species. But if you say that's the only source of human flourishing, I think you're staying pretty low on Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Mm -hmm. Technology <laughs> deals with the needs at the bottom of the scale. You know, it, it helps us to have uh, food, it helps us to have shelter, it helps us to have security, uh, it helps us to step up to communicate with each other. But ultimately, as you move up that scale, human beings need purpose, they need fulfillment. Mm -hmm. And uh, technology does not really address that in quite the same way. I think AI offers opportunities not simply to extend the capacity of our bodies but our minds, perhaps extending into pleasure, extending into meaning. If you look at gaming, gaming has enabled us to feel purpose and desire to achieve goals in a totally virtual environment. To give a more recent example, VR has been shown to give incredible dopamine rushes, uh, taking you into a new world but allowing you to accomplish and have a purpose does AI have the capacity to deliver on those um, higher up categories on the, on the Maslow's hierarchy, do you think? You know, it's interesting what you mentioned about amplification. Uh, there was a wonderful cartoon that came out when Deep Blue beat Gary Kasparov that uh, showed a whole range of technologies 
you know, from, from the wheel amplifying our ability to walk, from the telescope amplifying our eyesight. And, and with each one, people were saying, that's marvelous, that's marvelous. You know, and then the last one, it said, and a computer has beat a human at chess, and everyone was saying, oh my gosh, we're doomed. I think there is something a little bit threatening to many people about the idea that a computer can now amplify that part of us that we most identify with, and that is our minds. And so many people are deeply worried about the future trajectory of AI. Others feel that, wow, if we can amplify everything else, what might we not accomplish if we can amplify our minds? Certainly the computer has already solved problems in the realms of mathematics, in the realm of science, that it simply would have taken a human being too long to solve. In a lot of ways, it seems to be uh, in encouraging us in a direction where scientists are saying that we could upload our consciousness by the year 2045, which seems extraordinary. Max Tegmark um, draws three different, uh, three different stages to life. The first being life 1.0, where both the mind and the body, which he considers to be the hardware, both are fixed and unchanging. Uh, life 2.0, uh, we might be considered life 2.0 in that we can change our minds, we can change the software, but we can't change the hardware we're in. We're fundamentally limited but suggests that there may be the possibility of something beyond that, a life that could uh, both um, change, uh, change its own software and change its own hardware. Do you think that limit on our bodies is a restriction? We are embodied creatures. We certainly have some ability to change our bodies and technology has been a way in which we have accomplished this. Some of it has come simply through the feedback loop of using our technologies. For example, once we mastered cooking our food, and once we mastered milling our grains, so we had much softer food to deal with. Anthropologists have shown how the very shape of the human jaw and the human mouth has radically changed. Mm. So our technologies do become a part of the environment to which we adapt as creatures just as much as the natural environment wow. is a part of the environment that we adapt to. The real question, I think, for someone like Tegmark, um, and the futurist Ray Kurzweil raises the same question, is whether we could escape the body entirely. There's a difference between making incremental changes to the body and leaving the body completely. I'd just like to read you a couple of sentences that Kurzweil says. He writes, up until now, our mortality was tied to the longevity of our hardware. When our hardware crashed, that was it. As we cross the divide to instantiate ourselves into our computational technology, our identity will be based on an evolving file. We will be software, not hardware. As software, our mortality will no longer be dependent on the survival of the computing circuitry as we periodically port ourselves to the latest, ever more capable personal computer. He just reminds us that we better make sure to make backups along the way. <laughs> so Tegmark and Kurzweil are talking about this idea of completely downloading our brain to the computer. And for them, they see this as a way of grasping immortality without giving up a strictly materialistic scientific viewpoint. You don't need religion in this view. You don't need a god to save you. We can simply port ourselves up. But it means they're viewing us simply as information. Mm -hmm. In other words, that we are nothing but the patterns of the neuro neuronal connections in our brain. Mm -hmm. I think there are a couple of problems with that. Mm -hmm. Okay, the first problem. Kurzweil often says, well, look, we sequenced human DNA. We can sequence the connectome of the human brain, but he glosses over the fact that the human brain is massively more complex than our DNA structure. In our brain, we've got about 100 billion neurons, and each of those neurons can be connected, get this, can be connected to up to 10,000 other neurons. 
Each neuron. Each neuron. 10,000. Yeah, most of them aren't. Most of them, you know, maybe <laughs> several hundred or something. But they wow. could be, potentially. So what you've got there yeah. is, you know, trillions of connections. Mm -hmm. This is a complexity problem. Mm -hmm. But wait, there's more. Mm -hmm. I always wanted to say that. Okay, <laughs> there's also the role of numerous neurotransmitters. In other words, these connections are not direct. A signal goes from one neuron to the other over the synaptic gap, and it's either aided or hindered by a neurotransmitter. And so you have to put those in. But there's still more. We've got 100 million neurons in our gut, and those don't just handle our digestion. They play a big role in our emotions and our feeling of well-being as do the microbiota in our gut. So that says that a big part of being human isn't just what's in the brain, it's also what's in the gut, it's what's in the motor memory of the pianist, who just the muscles in her hand know how to play, and it's in the whole ecosystem we carry inside of us with our microbiota. This is a complexity problem that uh, I don't think we're anywhere near being able to solve with our computer technology, and certainly not by 2045, which is the date that Kurzweil gives these days. Wow. If it's a problem of compl simply a problem of complexity, is it solved simply by more computing power? A problem of complexity, yes, computing power helps, although there are some problems in computer science that we have long recognized are too complex. There are so many options. A simple one is the traveling salesman problem, where you just have a traveling salesman who has to find the optimal route for visiting a group of cities. And this sounds like it should be something quite easy to compute. And of course, it is quite easy to compute if you've only got four or five cities. But it's a problem that is an exponential problem. So as you add more cities, you don't just have a linear curve going up, you have an exponential curve. Mm. And whenever you have an exponential curve, you run into problems pretty quickly as soon as you hit that inflection point. But I think there's even a deeper problem, which is suppose more computing power did let us do this. Would we really want to? My prediction is that if we did manage to port somebody's brain into a computer, the very first thing it would say is, let me out of here. <laughs> Try to imagine the scenario of doing that. You go into the lab, they connect you up to some machinery, you know, it, it whirs and clicks and time goes by, and then after a while they disconnect you and say, oh, thank you, Dr. Hirschfeld, we've got you now. I'm still going to be right here. What's going to be in that machine is going to be, at best, some weird doppelganger that knows all of my history and my secrets, but it's going to diverge from me completely at that moment. I, I really like what you're saying there, because it seems like in, in, in transcending our limits, um, we actually lose um, some of what it becomes to be human. It's almost like in transcending our limits, our humanity becomes limited. Exactly. Can, and can I ask, what, what are the human limits that you think are good? Well, even Kurzweil said that the implementation of artificial intelligence in our biological systems will imply that we will be more machine than human. And I think one of the biggest ways that we see that is in the realm of emotion. For someone like Kurzweil, who thinks that we are basically information, uh, basically the patterns of our neurons, he's missing what the rest of the body contributes to that. When you feel an emotion, the, you, you see a stimulus, let's say it's that uh, lion in the underbrush, you get a physical response, that rush of adrenaline, that rush of cortisol, you know, that, that heart beating really fast. Then your cerebral cortex clicks in and says, what is this all about? Oh, lion in the brush, you know, <laughs> and you make a response and run away. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so it's a four-step process. And inside a computer, you're going to have trouble with that second step. You can still perceive a stimulus. 
you can still calculate a response and then make a response yourself. But there are people who do that, who don't actually feel an emotion, and we call them sociopaths. They perceive a stimulus. Many are very bright. They think, well, let's see, what should I do? And for a while, people are fooled by this, but eventually people find that uh, something seems off. There's no authenticity to the emotion. Mm. I think we would find, if we were ported up to machines, that our emotions would lose that authenticity. This is something that I think we've touched on before. AI is not simply an enhancement or an addition. It potentially leads to something other, to us becoming something other. Should we embrace this idea of the otherness, or is our humanity valuable? I don't believe that we should. I think artificial intelligence as an add-on to what we are is perfectly wonderful and gives us wonderful capabilities. But as a replacement, I think we would first of all cut ourselves off from the natural world that we are a part of. Carl Pope, a director of the Sierra Club, said, in losing our contact with the natural world, we're losing something precious. In a way, we're losing part of what it means to be human. We evolved in nature, dependent on its rhythms, inextricably connected to other living things. I think we break that connection at our peril. Uh, when, you, when you use the word peril, do you think it would be a kind of death? I think it could be a kind of psychic death. And I think the Japanese have recognized this. I mean, here you have perhaps one of the most technologically advanced societies, Tokyo, one of the largest cities on the planet. And yet among the Japanese, it has become a, almost a medical prescription that people go out and take forest baths. Hmm. And uh, it's just been recognized that for the stability of the human psyche, we need that contact, not just with the natural world outside of ourselves, but with our own bodies, with that sense that we are embodied creatures. And I think anybody who is faced with the question of, would you be perfectly happy to just FaceTime the woman you love, or would you rather actually be with her in a room, across a table, in a bed, together, we're high touch rather than high tech. We're all going to go for the physical presence. Mm -hmm. Even if it isn't about love, if someone says to you, I can give you a VR headset and you can see a perfect representation of the Taj Mahal, or I can fly you to India, take your pick, we're going to go to India. Mm -hmm. And that's just to give an example of the fact that it is precisely having limits to reach for, to transcend, that gives us purpose, that gives us fulfillment. Yes, you can move those limits, but if you take the limits away completely, what will you have left? Perhaps the question is not whether we can transcend all our limits through technology, but whether in doing so we leave our humanity behind. Noreen, thank you so much. It's been a fascinating conversation. Um, and actually, what I'm really excited about is you're, you're joining us for our next series. So uh, this can actually concludes our series on AI, and the next series is going to be on time. And we're going to be looking at whether we can outsource our memories to machines, which sounds a little bit mad. I'm very excited for it.